The conceptions of life in the world which we call philosophical are a product of two factors. One, inherited religious and ethical conceptions. The other, the sort of investigation which may be called scientific, using this word in the broadest sense. Individual philosophers have differed widely in regard to the propositions in which these two factors entered into their systems, but it's the presence of both in some degree that characterises philosophy. Philosophy is a word which has been used in many ways, some wider, some narrower. I propose to use it in a very wide sense, which I will now try to explain. Philosophy as I shall understand the word is something intermediate between theology and science. Like theology, it consists of speculations on matters as to which definite knowledge has, so far, been unascertainable. But like science, it appeals to human reason rather than to authority, whether that of tradition or that of revelation. All definite knowledge, so I should contend, belongs to science. All dogma, as to what surpasses definite knowledge, belongs to theology. But between theology and science, there is a no-man's land, exposed to attack from both sides. This no-man's land is philosophy. Almost all the questions of most interest to speculative minds are such as science cannot answer, and the confident answers of theologians no longer seem so convincing as they did in former centuries. Is the world divided into mind and matter? And, if so, what is mind and what is matter? Is mind subject to matter, or is it possessed of independent powers? Has the universe any unity or purpose? Is it evolving towards some goal? Are there really laws of nature, or do we believe in them only because of our innate love of order? Is man what he seems to the astronomer, a tiny lump of impure carbon and water impotently crawling on a small and unimportant planet? Or is he what he appears to Hamlet? Is he perhaps both at once? Is there a way of living that is noble and another that is base? Or are all the ways of living merely futile? If there is a way of living that is noble, in what does it consist, and how shall we achieve it? Must the good be eternal in order to deserve to be valued? Or is it worth seeking even if the universe is inexorably moving towards death? Is there such a thing as wisdom? Or is what seems such merely the ultimate refinement of folly? To such questions no answer can be found in the laboratory. Theologies have professed to give answers. All too definite. But their very definiteness causes modern minds to view them with suspicion. The studying of those questions, if not the answering of them, is the business of philosophy. Why then, you may ask? waste our time on such insoluble problems? To this one may answer as a historian, or as an individual facing the terror of cosmic loneliness. The answer of the historian, insofar as I am capable of giving it, will appear in the course of this work. Ever since men became capable of free speculation, their actions, in innumerable important respects, have depended upon their theories as to the world and human life, as to what is good and what is evil. This is as true in the present day as at any former time. To understand an age or a nation, we must understand its philosophy, and to understand its philosophy, we must ourselves be in some degree philosophers. There is here a reciprocal causation. The circumstances of men's lives do much to determine their philosophy, but conversely their philosophy does much to determine their circumstances. This interaction throughout the centuries will be the topic of the following pages. There is also, however, a more personal answer. Science tells us what we can know, but what we can know is little, and if we forget how much we cannot know, we become insensitive of many things of very great importance. Theology, on the other hand, induces a dogmatic belief that we have knowledge where in fact we have ignorance, and by doing so generates a kind of impertinent insolence towards the universe. Uncertainty in the presence of vivid hopes and fears is painful, but must be endured if we wish to live without the support of comforting fairy tales. It is not good either to forget the questions that philosophy asks, or to persuade ourselves that we have found indubitable answers to them. To teach how to live without certainty, and yet without being paralysed by hesitation, is perhaps the chief thing that philosophy in our age can still do for those who study it. Philosophy, as distinct from theology, began in Greece in the 6th century BC, after running its course in antiquity. It was again submerged by theology, as Christianity rose and Rome fell. Its second great period, from the 11th to the 14th centuries was dominated by the Catholic Church, except for a few great rebels, such as Emperor Frederick II, 1195-1250. This period was brought to an end by the confusions that culminated in the Reformation. The third period, from the 17th century to the present day, is dominated more than either of its predecessors by science. Traditional religious beliefs remain important, but are felt in need justification. 
and are modified wherever science seems to make this imperative. Few of the philosophers of this period are orthodox from a Catholic standpoint, and the secular state is more important in their speculations than the church. Social cohesion and individual liberty, like religion and science, are in a state of conflict or uneasy compromise throughout the whole period. In Greece, social cohesion was secured by loyalty to the city-state. Even Aristotle, though in his time Alexander was making the city-state obsolete, could see no merit in any other kind of polity. The degree to which the individual's liberty was curtailed by his duty to the city varied widely. In Sparta, he had as little liberty as in modern Germany or Russia. In Athens, in spite of occasional persecutions, citizens had, in the best period, a very extraordinary freedom from restrictions imposed by the state. Greek thought, down to Aristotle, is dominated by religious and patriotic devotion to the city. Its ethical systems are adapted to the lives of citizens and have a large political element. When the Greeks became subject, first to the Macedonians and then to the Romans, the conceptions appropriate to their days of independence were no longer applicable. This produced, on the one hand, a loss of vigour through the breach with tradition, and on the other hand, a more individual and less social ethic. The Stoics thought of the virtuous life as a relation of the soul to God, rather than as a relation of the citizen to the state. They thus prepared the way for Christianity, which, like Stoicism, was originally unpolitical, since during its first three centuries its adherents were devoid of influence on government. Social cohesion during that six and a half centuries from Alexander to Constantine was secured, not by philosophy and not by ancient loyalties, but by force, first that of armies and then that of civil administration. Roman armies, Roman roads, Roman law, and Roman officials first created and then preserved a powerfully centralised state. Nothing was attributable to Roman philosophy, since there was none. During this long period, the Greek ideas inherited from the Age of Freedom underwent a gradual process of transformation. Some of the old ideas, notably those which we should regard as specifically religious, gained in relative importance. Others, more rationalistic, were discarded because they no longer suited the spirit of the age. In this way, the later pagans trimmed the Greek tradition until it became suitable for incorporation into the Christian doctrine. Christianity popularised an important opinion, already implicit in the teachings of the Stoics, but foreign to the general spirit of antiquity. I mean the opinion that a man's duty to God is more imperative than his duty to the state. This opinion, that we ought to obey God rather than man, as Socrates and the Apostles said, survived the conversion of Constantine because the early Christian emperors were Arians or inclined to Arianism. When the emperors became orthodox, it fell into abeyance. In the Byzantine Empire, it remained latent, as also in the subsequent Russian Empire, which derived its Christianity from Constantinople. But in the West, where the Catholic emperors were almost immediately replaced, except in parts of Gaul by heretical barbarian conquerors, the superiority of religious to political allegiance survived and to some extent still survives. The barbarian invasion put an end for six centuries to the civilization of Western Europe. It lingered in Ireland until the Danes destroyed it in the 9th century. Before its extinction, there were produced one notable figure, Scotus Aragina. In the Eastern Empire, Greek civilization, in a desiccated form, survived as in a museum till the fall of Constantinople in 1453. But nothing of importance to the world came out of Constantinople, except an artistic tradition in Justinian's codes of Roman law. During the period of darkness from the end of the 5th century to the middle of the 11th, the Western Roman world underwent some very interesting changes. The conflict between duty to God and duty to state which Christianity had introduced took the form of a conflict between church and king. The ecclesiastical jurisdiction of the Pope extended over Italy, France and Spain, Great Britain and Ireland, Germany, Scandinavia and Poland. At first, outside Italy and southern France, his control over bishops and abbots was very slight, but from the time of Gregory VII, late 11th century, it became real and effective. From that time on, the clergy throughout Western Europe formed a single organisation directed from Rome, seeking power intelligently and relentlessly and usually victorious, until after the year 1300, in their conflicts with secular rulers. The conflict between church and state was not only a conflict between clergy and laity, it was also a renewal of the conflict between the Mediterranean world and the northern barbarians. The unity of the church echoed the unity of the Roman Empire, its liturgy was Latin, and its dominant men were mostly Italian, Spanish, and southern French. Their education, 
when education revived, was classical, their conceptions of law and government would have been more intelligible to Marcus Aurelius than they were to contemporary monarchs. The church represented at once continuity with the past and what was most civilised in the present. The secular power, on the contrary, was in the hands of kings and barons of Teutonic descent who endeavoured to preserve what they could of the institutions that they had brought out of the forests of Germany. Absolute power was alien to those institutions, and so was what appeared to these vigorous conquerors as a dull and spiritless legality. The king had to share his power with the feudal aristocracy, but all alike expected to be allowed occasional outbursts of passion in the form of war, murder, pillage, or rape. Monarchs might repent, for they were sincerely pious, and after all, repentance was itself a form of passion, but the church could never produce in them the quiet regularity of good behaviour which a modern employer demands, and usually obtains of his employees. What was the use of conquering the world if they could not drink and murder and love as the spirit moved them? And why should they, with their armies of proud knights, submit to the orders of bookish men, vowed to celibacy and destitute of armed force? In spite of ecclesiastical disapproval, they preserved to duel and trial by battle, and they developed tournaments and courtly love. Occasionally, in a fit of rage, they would even murder eminent churchmen. All the armed force was on the side of the kings, and yet the church was victorious. The church won, partly because it had almost a monopoly of education, partly because the kings were perpetually at war with each other, but mainly because, with very few exceptions, rulers and people alike profoundly believed that the church possessed the power of the keys. The church could decide whether a king would spend eternity in heaven or in hell. The church could absolve subjects from the duty of allegiance, and so stimulate rebellion. The church, moreover, represented order in place of anarchy, and consequently won, won the support of the rising mercantile class. In Italy, especially this last consideration was decisive. The Teutonic attempt to preserve at least a partial independence of the church expressed itself not only in politics, but also in art romance, chivalry and war. It expressed itself very little in the intellectual world, because education was almost wholly confined to the clergy. The explicit philosophy of the Middle Ages is not an accurate mirror of the times, but only of what was thought by one party. Among ecclesiastics, however, especially among the Franciscan friars, a certain number for various reasons were at variance with the Pope. In Italy, moreover, culture spread to the laity some centuries sooner than it did north of the Alps. Frederick II, who tried to found a new religion, represents the extreme of anti-papal culture. Thomas Aquinas, who was born in the Kingdom of Naples, where Frederick II was supreme, remains to this day the classic exponent of papal philosophy. Dante, some fifty years later, achieved a synthesis and gave the only balanced exposition of the complete medieval world of ideas. After Dante, both for political and for intellectual reasons, the medieval philosophical synthesis broke down. It had, while it lasted, a quality of tidiness and miniature completeness. Whatever the system took account of was placed with precision with relation to the other contents of its very finite cosmos. But the Great Schism, the Conciliar Movement, and the Renaissance Papacy led up to the Reformation which destroyed the unity of Christendom and the scholastic theory of government that centred round the Pope. In the Renaissance period, new knowledge, both of antiquity and of the Earth's surface, made men tired of systems which were felt to be mental prisons. The Copernican astronomy assigned to the Earth and to man a humbler position than they had enjoyed in the Ptolemaic theory. Pleasure in new facts took the place among intelligent men of pleasure in reasoning, analysis and systematising. Although in art the Renaissance is still orderly, in thought it prefers a large and fruitful disorder. In this respect, Montaigne is the most typical exponent of the age. In the theory of politics, as in everything except art, there was a collapse of order. The Middle Ages, though turbulent in practice, were dominated in thought by a passion for legality and by a very precise theory of political power. All power is ultimately from God. He has delegated power to the Pope in sacred things and to the Emperor in secular matters. But Pope and Emperor alike lost their importance during the 15th century. The Pope became merely one of the Italian princes, engaged in the incredibly complicated and unscrupulous game of Italian power politics. The new national monarchies in France, Spain and England had, in their own territories, a power with which neither Pope nor Emperor could interfere. The national state largely owing to gunpowder, acquired an influence over men's thoughts and feelings which it had not had before, and which progressively destroyed what remained of the Roman belief in the unity of civilization. This political disorder found expression in Machiavelli's Prince. 
In the absence of any guiding principle, politics becomes a naked struggle for power. The prince gives shrewd advice as to how to play this game successfully. What had happened in the Great Age of Greece happened again in Renaissance Italy. Traditional moral restraints disappeared because they were seen to be associated with superstition. The liberation from fetters made individuals energetic and creative, producing a rare fluorescence of genius. But the anarchy and treachery, which inevitably resulted from the decay of morals, made Italians collectively impotent, and they fell, like the Greeks, under the domination of nations less civilised than themselves, but not so destitute of social cohesion. The result, however, was less disastrous than in the case of Greece, because the newly powerful nations, with the exception of Spain, showed themselves as capable of great achievements as the Italians had been. From the 16th century onward, the history of European thought is dominated by the Reformation. The Reformation was a complex, many-sided movement, and owed its success to a variety of causes. In the main, it was a revolt of the northern nations against the renewed dominion of Rome. Religion was the force that had subdued the north, but religion in Italy had decayed. The papacy remained as an institution, and extracted a huge tribe from Germany and England, but these nations, which were still pious, could feel no reverence for the Borgias and Medicis, who professed to save souls from purgatory in return for cash which they squandered on luxury and immorality. National motives, economic motives, and moral motives all combined to strengthen the revolt against Rome. Moreover, the princes soon perceived that if the church in their territories became merely national, they would be able to dominate it, and would thus become much more powerful at home than they had been while sharing dominion with the Pope. For all these reasons, Luther's theological innovations were welcomed by rulers and peoples alike throughout the greater part of Northern Europe. The Catholic Church was derived from three sources. Its sacred history was Jewish, its theology was Greek, its government and canon law were, at least indirectly, Roman. The Reformation rejected the Roman elements, softened the Greek elements, and greatly strengthened the Judaic elements. It thus cooperated with the nationalist forces, which were undoing the work of social cohesion, which had been affected first by the Roman Empire and then by the Roman Church. In Catholic doctrine, divine revelation did not end with the scriptures, but continued from age to age, through the medium of the Church, to which, therefore, it was the duty of individuals to submit his private opinions. Protestants, on the contrary, rejected the Church as a vehicle of revelation. Truth was to be sought only in the Bible, which each man could interpret for himself. If men differed in their interpretation, there was no divinely appointed authority to decide the dispute. In practice, the state claimed the right that had formerly belonged to the church, but this was a usurpation. In Protestant theory, there should be no earthly intermediary between the soul and God. The effects of this change were momentous. Truth was no longer to be ascertained by consulting authority, but by inward meditation. There was a tendency quickly developed towards anarchism in politics and in religion towards mysticism, which had always fitted with difficulty into the framework of Catholic orthodoxy. There came to be not one Protestantism, but a multitude of sects, not one philosophy opposed to scholasticism, but as many as there were philosophers, not as in the 13th century one emperor opposed to the Pope, but a large number of heretical kings. The result, in thought as in literature, was a continually deepening subjectivism, operating at first as a wholesome liberation from spiritual slavery, but advancing steadily towards a personal isolation inimical to social sanity. Modern philosophy begins with Descartes, whose fundamental certainty is the existence of himself and his thoughts, from which the external world is to be inferred. This was only the first stage in a development through Berkeley and Kant to Fichte, for whom everything is only an emanation of the ego. This was insanity, and, from the extreme, philosophy had been attempting, ever since, to escape into the world of everyday common sense. With subjectivism in philosophy, anarchism in politics goes hand in hand. Already during Luther's lifetime, unwelcome and unacknowledged disciples had developed the doctrine of Anabaptism, which for a time dominated the city of Munster. The Anabaptists repudiated all law since they held that the good man will be guided at every moment by the Holy Spirit, who cannot be bound by formulas. From this premise, they arrive at communism and sexual promiscuity. They were therefore exterminated after a heroic resistance. But their doctrine in softened form spread to Holland, England, and America. Historically, it's the source of Quakerism. A fiercer form of anarchism, no longer connected with religion, arose in the 19th century. In Russia, in Spain, and to a lesser degree in Italy, it had considerable success, and to this day it remains a bugbear of the American immigration authorities. This modern form, though anti-religious, has still much of the spirit of early Protestantism. 
It differs mainly in directing against secular governments the hostility that Luther directed against popes. Subjectivity, once let loose, could not be confined within limits until it had run its course. In morals, the Protestant emphasis on the individual conscience was essentially anarchic. Habit and custom were so strong that, except in occasional outbreaks such as that of Munster, the disciples of individualism in ethics continued to act in a manner which was conventionally virtuous. But this was a precarious equilibrium. The 18th century cult of sensibility began to break it down. An act was admired not for its good consequences or for its conformity to a moral code, but for the emotion that inspired it. Out of this attitude developed the cult of the hero, as it is expressed by Carlyle and Nietzsche and the Byronic cult of violent passion, of no matter what kind. The Romantic movement in art, in literature, and in politics is bound up with this subjective way of viewing men. Not as members of a community, but as aesthetically delightful objects of contemplation. Tigers are more beautiful than sheep, but we prefer them behind bars. The typical Romantic removes the bars and enjoys the magnificent leaps with which the tiger annihilates the sheep. He exhorts men to imagine themselves tigers, and when he succeeds, the results are not wholly pleasant. Against the more insane forms of subjectivism in modern times, there have been various reactions. First, a halfway compromise philosophy, the doctrine of liberalism, which attempted to assign the respective spheres of government and the individual. This begins in its modern form with Locke, who is as much opposed to enthusiasm, the individualism of the Anabaptists, as to absolute authority and blind subservience to tradition. A more thoroughgoing revolt leads to doctrine of state worship, which assigns to the state the position that Catholicism gave to the church, or even sometimes to God. Hobbes, Rousseau, and Hegel represent different phases of this theory, and their doctrines are embodied practically in Cromwell, Napoleon, and modern Germany. Communism, in theory, is far removed from such philosophies, but is driven in practice to a type of community very similar to that which results from state worship. Throughout this long development, from 600 BC to the present day, philosophers have been divided into those who wish to tighten social bonds and those who wish to relax them. With this difference, others have been associated. The disciplinarians have advocated some system of dogma, either old or new, and have therefore been compelled to be, in a greater or less degree, hostile to science, since their dogmas could not be proved empirically. They have almost invariably taught that happiness is not the good, but that nobility or heroism is to be preferred. They have had a sympathy with the irrational parts of human nature, since they have felt reason to be inimical to social cohesion. The libertarians, on the other hand, with the exception of the extreme anarchists, have tended to be scientific, utilitarian, rationalistic, hostile to violent passion, and enemies of all the more profound forms of religion. This conflict existed in Greece before the rise of what we recognise as philosophy, and is already quite explicit in the earliest Greek thought, in changing forms it has persisted down to the present day, and no doubt will persist for many ages to come. It's clear that each party to this dispute, as to all that persists through long periods of time, is partly right and partly wrong. Social cohesion is a necessity, and mankind has never yet succeeded in enforcing cohesion by merely rational arguments. Every community is exposed to two opposite dangers. Ossification through too much discipline and reverence for tradition on the one hand. On the other hand, dissolution or subjection to foreign conquest through the growth of an individualism and personal independence that makes cooperation impossible. In general, important civilizations start with a rigid and superstitious system, gradually relaxed and leading to a certain stage, to a period of brilliant genius. While the good of the old tradition remains and the evil inherent in its dissolution has not yet developed, but as the evil unfolds, it leads to anarchy, thence, inevitably, to a new tyranny, producing a new synthesis secured by a new system of dogma. The doctrine of liberalism is an attempt to escape from this endless oscillation. The essence of liberalism is an attempt to secure a social order not based on a rational dogma and ensuring stability without involving more restraints than are necessary for the preservation of the community. Whether this attempt can succeed